the obesity epidemic usually isn't something you want to talk about at the dinner hour, um, but uh, I'm happy to do so. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about sort of where we are, what's the magnitude of the issue right now, a little bit about the contributing factors. As you can imagine, this is a very complicated topic and um, one in which um, we're really working hard on right now. Um, and I want to end the talk uh, a little, uh, speaking very specifically about one initiative that we're working on. So I'm trying to be very focused here. So my first question is, where did this quote come from? I have two quotes. I'm convinced that inactivity is the most important factor explaining the frequency of creeping overweight in modern Western societies. Same person said this, in the past decade, it has become obvious that our food supply is undergoing extremely rapid change from primary food to highly processed convenient foods. So does anybody know who said this? Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama, no, although she would say it now, but somebody said it before. Jean Mayer. <laughs> Dr. Jean Mayer said this. Um, he said this now, does anybody know what year he said it? 1959, Dr. Meyer, as president of Tufts, really set a nutrition agenda that has a strong and lasting legacy. And I feel very privileged to be uh, a, a, a graduate of the, the School of Nutrition at that point in time at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy now. Um, he certainly was someone um, that I was lucky enough to get to work with a little bit, but was very influential in terms of his thinking. So I want to show you some slides looking at the magnitude of the problem. And these are starting from 1985 um, all the way up to 2010, and this is the obesity epidemic. Um, the dark blue is 15 to 19 percent, the light blue is uh, uh, 10 to 14 percent. Then we go into the 25 to 29 percent. This is not a political map, <laughs> although it looks like it. Um, but it's really astounding. Whenever I see these slides, I must say they make me more energized to work on this issue. When we think about children, the data on children are such that depending on the age, they are either, um, the obesity rates have either doubled, tripled, or quadrupled. So this is a major epidemic for children as well as for adults. Two-thirds of adults are either overweight or obese. Um, and this is not just a national pro problem, this is also an international problem. So not too long ago, I'm gonna tell a little bit of the story. Not too long ago, um, I was at uh, giving a talk. This was about uh, five years ago or so. And my lovely husband, who is incredibly supportive of me, um, was at the talk and he heard me speak and we're driving home, and he says, so honey, I know you've been really hard at work, feeling like you're making a great impact, but I look at those slides and I wonder, what have you been doing for the last two and a half decades? And I really do think that all of us, every single one of us, has to be thinking in a different way. We have to be thinking of this epidemic um, and way beyond personal responsibility. We have to be looking at it from a systems, um, systems uh, uh, sort of dynamic uh, a realm of thinking. Um, so why do we care? What's the impact? What are the problems? Well, beyond the obvious health problems that we know about with heart disease and diabetes and um, arthritis and different types of cancer, about 25% cancers are attributable now to obesity epidemic. There, what I would say is that there are three main reasons. The first is actually environmental. Now you might say, why does this have an environmental impact? Well, in fact, um, the foods that we're producing right now have a, that are unhealthy have a much bigger um, carbon footprint. Um, whether you uh, like this or not, um, the fact that people are heavier actually reduces our uh, our mileage in our, uh, our cars so that it is, um, our mileage goes down. We are actually using a billion more gallons of gasoline a year just because people are heavier. 
So there is an economic, or rather a um, environmental piece to this. There is obviously a large economic piece as well. The latest um, Brookings report that was done a couple of years ago um, uh, attributes about $215 billion a year not to compete with Alzheimer's. All of these um, issues are, are major, but um, due directly to healthcare costs and lost productivity, so there is a massive economic um, uh, issue here. And then finally, there is a national security issue. The fact that one third of recruits of eligible recruits into the armed forces are literally too fat to fight is really having a impact on our national security and our armed forces. And this is why I really believe that, that finally there is sort of a collective interest to um, really work on this issue, especially um, childhood obesity. So, something somewhere went terribly wrong. <laughs> And when we, we know that there is, the energy balance matters, whether we like it or not, the physics of energy balance matters, but this is very complicated, as I'll talk about in just a second. But when we look at physical activity, about 15% of the population actually exercises um, uh, on a regular basis. That hasn't changed in 40 years, but what has changed is that the way we commute, we, uh, we drive cars a lot more when we don't walk. We, um, the way we work, we sit at our desks instead of manual labor. And we have far, far, far more entertaining sedentary activities with all the different screen time. In fact, the average household has a television on for seven and a half hours a day. The average person's watching about two and a half hours a day. So in terms of energy expenditure, the, the estimates are somewhere in the vicinity of 200 to even 600 calories a day that we're not expending. If anybody knows about the um, how you gain weight or lose weight, that's a lot of energy each day. So what about the American diet? Well, the main word here is more. And what we have mostly is we have more calories. Um, in fact, per capita, we have a lot more calories that are available. And unfortunately, the calories are, for the most part, very, very cheap and not very healthy. We also have a lot more added sugar in the food supply. So, I have my little prop, I love props. So this has actually about 35 teaspoons of sugar in it. Now the average 22 year old senior at a college, not Tufts, um, <laughs> the average young man is getting this amount of sugar in their food supply, not by adding it to their cereal anymore, but it's embedded in the food supply. This is 35 uh, teaspoons. The average 40-year-old woman is getting about 24. There's a huge amount of added sugar that has uh, infiltrated our diet. But actually, the largest contributor to increased calories over the last 40 years is, is refined grains. And if I had another lecture at some point in time, which I hope to get to do, I'd love to talk to you about the, the influence of grains on, um, on our health, on the obesity epidemic, the autoimmune system. It's really phenomenal and very interesting what's happened to grains, but that's um, for another lecture. We don't have much in the way of actual fruits and vegetables. They're, they're actually not very accessible for many people in the population. And if every single one of us tomorrow woke up and ate five fruits and vegetables a day, which the average is actually less than three. But if we all got up and ate five fruits and vegetables, we'd be 10 million acres shy in production of having enough fruits and vegetables. We have plenty of grains, but we actually don't have the right kinds of grains. And um, I was lucky enough uh, last fall, I, I did a, a really fun project. I felt like it was time to really get out in the communities. And I did a civic engagement project where I started in Kenai, Alaska, and I went down to Washington State and then drove across the country and worked in eight rural communities and also um, met with different farmers. Uh, Sam and Brooke Lucy here at Bluebird Grain Farms in Northeast uh, Cascades are growing um, an ancient wheat, emmer, which actually has the same um, genetic makeup of the wheat that we actually ate a thousand years ago. So there is some spots of innovation that's very exciting out there, but it's too few and too far between. So it may seem completely daunting, this issue of the obesity epidemic. I walk through Penn Station and I look around with my colleague. Last week, Chris Conmos and I were here, and we looked and we both looked at each other and said, 
There is no way that we can actually do this. But the fact is, is that I think that the cliff may be high and the, 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 the course may not be all that clear. But at some point in time, and I like to make fun of myself, um, at some point in time, we got to stop talking about this and we actually have to just dive in and we have to do something about this. And that's really what we're working on right now at the Friedman School. Um, I've been lucky enough to, to found and direct the John Hancock Research Center on uh, Physical Activity, Nutrition, and Obesity Prevention. And the co-director is my, my very, very smart and innovative colleague, Christina Economos. And our work at the center is both from the biological to the public policy to sort of the societal end. And most of our work has actually been in communities across the country, from working with new immigrants in Somerville to our Strongman programs that is national in about 35 states. But what I want to talk to you today in my few remaining minutes is to really talk about one project, our largest project at the moment, which is something that we call Child Obesity 180 reverse the trend. Three years ago, uh, trustee Peter Dolan called me up and he said, I have some time. I am really upset about this childhood obesity epidemic and I don't think enough of the, the world is really doing anything about this. I have the time and I feel like that I could make a real difference and I want to help. So Chris, Peter and I, work together over about three or four months to begin with to really understand the landscape of what's out there. What we saw, which really echoed the, uh, what the Institute of Medicine showed, was that there's a lot of different activities going on, but they're too few, too small, and too uncoordinated. We, when we looked at other social change models, and we look at what is, am I okay here? <laughs> you want me to use the mic? Okay. It's hard for me to stand behind the podium, but okay. Um, when we looked at other successful social change models, what we saw was that at each one of them, when multiple sectors and the leadership of multiple sectors comes together to create change, that's when you start to see things happening. So the idea was that we thought if we could bring CEO level leaders together from different sectors, the food sector, the private sector, the government sector, from the White House, from the uh, Department of Education, the USDA, from academia, and from um, uh, advocacy groups and foundations, that if we could get these leaders together, we could prioritize a set of recommendations and then develop initiatives that we believed collectively could make a difference. And so that's what we've done. The first sort of proof of concept with bringing the charter members together. And we have 19 charter members um, from around the country that do represent these four different sectors, from the CEO of Sesame Street to the CEO of the YMCA, um, Kroger's, uh, um, uh, um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a whole mix of fabulous leaders that have personally committed to this to come together. The next was, could we raise the funds? And in fact, we've been very fortunate over the last three years. Um, the, the initial fund, funds came from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but now we've matched their funds. Um, we've doubled them, and we've raised about 14, 15 million uh, dollars over the last um, year to help fund this work, and we certainly need a lot more um, to do it. The next was, could we hire a fantastic innovative staff? So our staff is actually, I don't want to say they're no longer nutritionists, and I, I don't want to, um, that's not the right way to put it, but in order to solve this problem, we actually need communications experts, social change experts, um, uh, masters in, in business administration, sociologists, and that's what we've been doing, and we now have about a 25 person team. The way we've thought about this is there's a lot of recommendations out there that stand on, uh, on different bookshelves. And what we did was we looked at a lot of the recommendations. In fact, uh, Chris and myself have been on a lot of these recommendations. I was on the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Chris is on the Standing Committee for Obesity, Childhood Obesity Prevention at the Institute of Medicine. But we looked at um, the top 15 that we thought would actually have an impact. And then we put them through a filter with our 19 charter members looking at how scalable are they? What's the evidence? Is it feasible to really ramp this up? Is there equity? Are we going to be reaching the most at risk children? 
Um, will they lend themselves to these priorities, lend themselves to a multi-sector um, initiative approach? And what will have the fastest time to result? From that, we came up with four different priority areas. Uh, physical activity, access to food, that's both increasing healthy foods and decreasing unhealthy foods. The old adage that all foods fit, I just don't buy it anymore because most foods are not so good for you anymore. Um, eating out in restaurants and then marketing to kids. So what we really are looking at is, is the different environments that children are living in and thinking about how we can influence the ba calorie balance. Um, from this, we've come up with five different initiatives right now. I'm going to talk about only one of them that sort of represents our approach. But with all of the initiatives, the key has been thinking about which ones will really truly have a 10x impact and really influence the 50 million children that were, is really in our target groups, because that's the age between about 5 to 12 years of age. So the one initiative I want to talk about is our healthy kids out of school. The idea here, and led through one of our charter members, Neil Nickel, who's the CEO of the YMCA, was the after-school environment for children is really can be a wasteland in terms of the types of foods that are served and the amount of physical activity that children get. The idea was if we could bring leaders, CEOs, from the largest after-school programs together, we could have an impact. From this, we developed partnerships with nine CEOs from these partner organizations to come together. And these organizations, what's amazing is that these CEOs had never been together before in the same room, yet they're all seeing these children. And collectively, these CEOs, the programs that they are directing, reaches tens of millions of children every day. I can't tell you the exact number because um, the 4-H is seeing 4 million and the Y is seeing 5 million and there's some cross, um, there, some children are going to different organizations. The idea was that through the evidence, what we saw, what we looked at and we worked with these CEOs was to develop three guiding principles that they would adopt and then um, push down through their organizations and then we would work from a grassroots up is to drink right, drink water instead of sugar-sweetened beverages, to move more, no matter what the after-school activity is, and to snack smart on fruits and vegetables and, um, and focus just on fruits and vegetables. So with Child Obesity 180, our idea really is here to empower leadership at the highest level, to unite multiple sectors together, and to accelerate collective impact to reverse the trend. For me, as a scientist, this is so much fun because I feel very fortunate that I work within a university that actually embraces the social entrepreneur, that embraces working across disciplines. My greatest colleagues are not only at the Friedman School, but in medicine, in TISH, in engineering, arts and sciences, and um, some of whom are also in, in the veterinary school. And I feel very fortunate that through the learnings of, of a project like Child Obesity 180 and working with colleagues such as my colleague Chris Economos and others, that the new knowledge that we gain from this project, we believe can be used for really focusing on other societal change. So I just want to leave and say that I'm very optimistic. We know in New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, in uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, Hernando, Mississippi, the child obesity rates are going down using methods such as this. I think we can change this. It's going to take time, and it's going to take a collective effort. So thank you very, very much.